Let's uh, bow our heads together as we pray this afternoon. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we need no other evidence. We need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and rose again for me. Father, we're gathered here this afternoon as your people to look at the pillars of prophecy. We pray that our faith would be built up, that our assurance in the future would be rock solid in Jesus Christ. And today, as we look at the prophecies of Daniel, we pray that you would lead us and guide us. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we get into the heart of today's study, found in Daniel chapter 2, I wanted to spend a few moments recognizing that we are living in an age and a time in which people are wondering about the future, and it happens to be the year 2012. And I want to begin by reading a quotation that was in the media by an individual that believes that 2012 is a significant year for our human civilization. And I quote, it says, You have to understand that there will be nothing, nothing left. Gerald told ABC News from his home in Belgium, We will have to start everything, the entire civilization, from scratch. That's because Gerald believes that the world as we know it will end in 2012, and he points to the ancient Mayan cyclical calendar, the longest of which last renewed itself approximately 5,125 years ago, is set to end again supposedly with catastrophic circumstances. He speaks of the ancient Egyptians who he claims saw the year 2012 as a year of great change. And he goes on, Only the prepared will survive, and not even all of them. These may sound like the ravings of a madman, or perhaps the head of a small apocalyptic sect, but Gerald is not the only one who believes in the apocalypse of 2012. Thousands of people worldwide seem to be preparing in one way or another for the end of days in 2012 and survival groups exist today in Europe, Canada, and the United States. I'd like to move on to another group of individuals. These are scientists that are saying that our civilization as we know it may come to an end in the next century. By the way, I don't believe in the 2012 scenario. Just to be clear. And this is from a program called the Earth 2100. And what this program did was they went to some of the top scientists at Harvard, Yale, some of the Ivy League schools of our day, and asked them what was their future or what was the future of the human civilization. And the question goes like this as they begin this program, and this is from a secular media source, and it says, are we living in the last century of our civilization? These are not religionists. These are intelligent people, secular, perhaps agnostic, and they say, is it possible that all of our technology, knowledge, and wealth cannot save us from ourselves? Could our society actually be heading toward collapse? According to many of the world's top scientists, the answer is yes, unless we take action now. Experts say that extreme changes in climate, combined with dwindling resources, famine, war, disease, have the potential to create, and notice the words here, a post-apocalyptic world in less than 100 years. Harvard University and Woods Hole climatologist John Holdren says we cannot continue going down the same path. If we continue on as business as usual, we are going to see more floods, more droughts, more heat waves, more wildfires, more ice melting, faster sea levels rise, Holdren says. Here's a climatologist, a person from Harvard University that says as he looks into the future, 
as a scientist, he doesn't believe that we have much hope of making it out of the next hundred years. There's another book by Dr. Eugene Linden. And this is a book that was at the top of the New York Times bestselling list. He's a renowned journalist for the Time magazine. And his book is entitled The Future in Plain Sight. And he says, The Rise of True Believers and Other Clues to the Coming Instability. That's code for a crisis in the future. And he notes these things are characteristics of a coming collapse in the near future. Number one, the collapse of our integrated global economy. We saw that in 2008, almost. The massive, unprecedented migration of the rural to the world's bursting cities. Urban, national, and global overcrowding through populations' explosions. The widening gap between the rich and the poor. The ominous rising of the sea levels. The spreading collapse of the bio-ecosystems of life on our planet water and food shortages from troubling climate changes, the resurgence of spreading infectious diseases, and then he says, last but not least, growing radical right-wing fundamentalism in all world religions. Here's a, a secular individual saying that the way he sees it, there is going to come an instability here in the near future. And there's a gentleman by the name of Stephen Hawking. He's an astrophysicist. He holds the Lucasian Chair of Mathematics at Cambridge University, and many people esteem him to be the modern-day Albert Einstein. He has Lou Gehrig's disease, is paralyzed, and has to communicate through a speech synthesizer, which detects one millimeter movement of his index finger. And this gentleman that does not believe in God says that this is the solution for the problems that we as a human race face. And I quote, this is Stephen Hawking, a brilliant scientist. And he says, it is important for the human race to spread out into space for the survival of the species. Are you hearing me? This is his solution. The brightest man that many people say have the highest IQ that is off the charts, and he's looking into the future, and he says, the human solution for our extinction is to spread out into space. Now, I don't know about you, but that is not very comforting for me. <laughs> it says, it's important for the human race to spread out into space for the survival of the species. Hawking says, life on Earth is at an ever-increasing risk of being wiped out by disaster such as sudden nuclear war, a genetically engineered virus, or other dangers we have not yet thought of. Here are the brightest people that are looking at Earth's problems and they are scratching their heads and saying that we do not have the solution whether it be the economy, whether it be natural disasters, thinking people everywhere are looking into this century that we are living in right now and saying that we, if we are not careful, we are headed toward extinction. And they use the word post-apocalyptic world. I'm so glad for prophecy. Amen? Because if I did not believe in God or the inspiration of the Word of God, what do you have to hang your hat on? Absolutely nothing. And I'm so glad that 3ABN this weekend has focused on the pillars of prophecy. And I want to start out by beginning with the words of Jesus. If you would turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 14, verse 29. Jesus talks about predictive prophecy, and he talks about the purpose of predictive prophecy. John chapter 14, verse 29. As we look at world events, as we look at the coming instability, the coming crisis that many people will take us to the very brink of human extinction, we can look at John chapter 14, verse 29, the words of Jesus Christ himself, and have hope. 
John chapter 14, verse 29. He says, And now I have told you, what does the Bible say? Before it comes, that way, when it does come to pass, you may what? You may believe. The Bible tells us, Jesus tells us, before it happens, that way, when it happens, you may believe. Now, predictive prophecy is not so it can just tickle our fancy so we can know what will come in the future. It always points us to Jesus Christ. Prophecy is always Christocentric. Amen? Jesus is always at the center of prophecy. And here Jesus tells us that when it happens, you may believe. And it's my prayer today that as we look at the prophecies of the Bible that it will build our faith in Jesus Christ. I'd like to turn to one other New Testament passage. It's found in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15. This is known as the great eschatological chapter in the Bible. Jesus is looking down to the end of time. He's worried about the Christians. And in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, Jesus gives an endorsement that I find nowhere else in Scripture from the mouth of Jesus Christ Himself. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. Jesus focusing on end times events, He says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Now we can preach a whole sermon just on this verse, but I want to point out three simple observations from Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. And number one, Jesus assumes, or rather I should say, Jesus declares that Daniel is a prophet. Amen. Here Jesus is giving the divine endorsement, and Jesus Christ himself says Daniel is trustworthy. He gives revelation that is inspired by God. Amen? Amen? Daniel is a prophet, and if you believe in Jesus, you have to believe that Daniel has something to say for God's people living in the end of time. Amen? Amen. There's a lot of people, Christians, that say that the book of Daniel is a closed book. It's irrelevant. It doesn't have anything to say about God's people living in the last days. But if you believe in Jesus, Jesus says Daniel's a prophet. Thus, we can trust to him. Trust in Daniel. Number two, Jesus points out that the book of Daniel is relevant to God's last day people. It is relevant. Not irrelevant. It is something that we should pay attention to as we are approaching the very final moments of earth's history. Number three, Jesus gives a divine endorsement that we should read and study the book of Daniel. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a pretty good endorsement. There are times that I meet someone that I want to know what their reading list is. And I say, are there any books that you should recommend? And they give me a list of books, and I go when I have the money, on Amazon.com, and I purchased those books just based on the recommendation of the person that gave me those books to read. And here's Jesus saying, look, God's people living in the last days, read the book of Daniel. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty good endorsement, amen? And it's with these thoughts, with these concepts at heart that we are looking at the book of Daniel Pastor Stephen Bohr gave a beautiful theme presentation on the book of Daniel, and I'd like to highlight some of these as we go on. The book of Daniel is divided into two major portions, the prophetic and the historic, or the narrative. There are eight stories found interspersed throughout the book of Daniel. And incidentally, six of the stories are characteristics that we are to develop, and two of the stories are characteristics that we are to avoid. Incidentally, the word Daniel, the name Daniel means God is my judge. And when you look at the last church living right before the end of time, 
It is the word, the name Laodicea. Incidentally, the word Laodicea doesn't mean lukewarm, even though that's one of the characteristics. Laodicea means a people judged. I believe that Daniel is a type of God's people living right before the final moments of earth's history. The book of Daniel is built upon the principle of repeat and enlarge, and I've been given the privilege of looking at Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, 7, and 8 repeat the same theme, the same structure, but enlarge upon themselves as they go through this presentation. I'd like to invite you with that brief introduction to turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 2, the book of Daniel chapter 2, as we look at the narrative and then we go into the prophetic revelation found in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 2, by the way, Daniel was taken as a 17-year-old boy. Many scholars assume that he was just a teenager, around 17 years of age. He was taken from Jerusalem into Babylon, and they say that he probably had to go on a 1,000-mile march through the desert as a teenager. They say that he was placed under the prince of the eunuchs, which scholars assume that he was a eunuch himself. You don't read about Mrs. Daniel in the Bible. That was because they had to go through this terrible process. The king wanted to ensure that these men were always thinking about the king's business and not anyth anything else. And you can imagine, as a teenager, he goes through this terrible experience. He's emasculated. He has to go on a 1,000-mile march through the desert from Jerusalem to Babylon. And you would have to think that in Daniel's mind, there would be some questions in regards to God's faithfulness. But Daniel remained faithful to God, as you see in Daniel chapter 1. Let's read on in Daniel chapter 2. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, to tell the king his dream. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in the Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream, its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made an ash heap. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. They answered and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will give its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time, because you see that my decision is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream, there is only one decree for you, for you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me the interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such a thing of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with the flesh. For this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out, and they began killing the wise men. They sought Daniel and his companions to kill them as well. They had a different time of employment back in those days, as you can see. You didn't just get fired. <laughs> and you can imagine the audacity of this request. The king has a nightmare. And in those days, they assumed that every dream had specific revelation. And the king asked the wise men, listen, I had a dream, but I forgot it. 
Please tell me the dream and the interpretation. The wise men say, tell us the dream and we'll make up an interpretation. They didn't say that, but that's what they meant. And as they go on, they go back and forth. And finally, the king says to them, look, you're a farce. You're a fallacy. You're not really wise men and you're going to be exterminated. This reaches Daniel. Let's pick up in verse 14. Then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to the Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house made the decision made known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah and his companions that they might seek the mercies from God of heaven concerning the secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. I'd like to pause here for a moment because I know that many of you are individuals that are seeking to know more about the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. And this is an important point that we cannot miss. If you are seeking divine illumination regarding prophecy, it always begins with prayer. Amen? Amen? Daniel was a brilliant individual. He went to the Ivy League schools of his day and he came out on top. He had a very high IQ and even Daniel recognized that he needed divine help. So anytime you're studying prophecy our own methodologies, we always have to submit to the Holy Spirit's leading and we go on our knees and say, Lord, I need help. I need divine illumination because I can't do this on our own. And prayer inherently assumes our dependence. Is saying that this is outside of ourselves. Daniel went home, got his best friends together, and said, we need to have a prayer meeting. Incidentally, the Adventist church began the same way. They were wrestling with the prophecies of Daniel Revelation, and they would have prayer meetings and Bible studies, and we need to have that happening again as God's people are approaching the final moments of earth's history. You can imagine... Daniel's there. He's saying, look, we need to pray because this is outside of our control. And any time in our own human experience we face an impossibility, we need to go to the God that specializes the, in the impossible. Amen? And here Daniel prays. And verse 19, you can imagine what happens in the midst of Daniel's sleep. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered, and this is a beautiful poetic prayer here found in Daniel chapter 2, verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the God forever and ever. His wisdom and might are His. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises them up. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with them. I thank you and I praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might, and now I have made known unto me what we have asked unto you, and you have made known unto us the king's demand. Daniel then goes in before the king and tells him what he dreamed in his own bed. Let's go on to verse 26. For the sake of time. Then the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name is Belshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he has made known to the king what will be in the latter's days? Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed are these. I'd like to pause for a moment, and if you look in verse 28, here Daniel gives God the credit for what he has done. Daniel could have very easily said, you know, I'm a very wise man, 
and I've come up with the dream and the interpretation. And it's important for all of us, especially those of us in ministry, like myself, to always give God the glory for what He has done. I believe the pitfall always arises when we take the credit when God uses people. Here, Daniel goes on and gives the king his dream. Verse 29. As for you, O king, the thoughts came upon your mind while you were on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals the secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, the secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone else living. But for our sakes, who make known the interpretation to the king, that you may know the hearts, the thoughts of your heart. Verse 31, You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. The image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on the feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Here, Nebuchadnezzar is simply stunned because he remembers what he has dreamed. This is an unusual dream in that it is a metal image, and it's comprised of four different metals. It is a metal man. Its head is of gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet partly of iron, and partly of clay. And in the dream, as they are witnessing this impressive image, there comes a stone that is uncut without human hands and strikes the base of the image, and the entire image is pulverized before their eyes. The stone grows and fills the entire earth, and then Daniel proceeds to give the interpretation of the dream. Now, I want to pause here for a moment and establish for us that I believe that out of all of the prophecies that are given in the book of Daniel, this prophecy lays the foundation for the understanding of the entire book. It is the basic framework. In other words, if you misinterpret Daniel chapter 2, you have no hope when it comes to Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8. And Daniel chapter 2 is the most compelling for many individuals that foretells the future many hundreds of years before these kingdoms ever came into being, as you will later see. Many people have said that Daniel really did not write the book of Daniel because Daniel chapter 2 is so compelling. How did he know that these kingdoms, as you will later see, came in rapid succession? Some people assume that Daniel really didn't write this book. It was an obscure individual that lived in Greece many years later, and he could write this from a historical perspective, rather. But you can see that Daniel is authorized and endorsed by Jesus Christ himself. Amen? As we've seen earlier. So you can trust that this is truly inspired by God. Let's go to the interpretation of the dream. We don't have to make this up. We don't have to pull these things out of thin air. We just have to read the Bible, which is basically what I'm doing here in this presentation. Let's go to verse 36. This is a dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings, for the God of heaven is given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, and the birds of heaven, he has given them into your hand, And has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. Now Nebuchadnezzar is liking this dream and the interpretation so far. Because gold was the most precious metal out of the four that were given. I want you to notice some simple observations about the metals. It starts with gold, silver, bronze, and iron. It decreases in value, but increases in strength. And here... Daniel says, you, 
The kingdom of Babylon is the head of gold. I heard one scholar say that even as the head defines the body, so did Babylon define the rest of the kingdoms when it came to pagan philosophy. And it's so true because seminally, philosophically, in the kingdom of Babylon, there are remnants of that pagan philosophy that are with us to this day. Sun worship was passed down from Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, and is with us to this day. Idol worship began in Babylon. The immortality of the soul began in Babylon. And as each one of these kingdoms came and conquered the previous kingdom, they took on the philosophies that Babylon imbibed. You are this head of gold. Babylon ruled from 605 to 539 BC, and it was known for its opulent hanging gardens. Just some facts here. The temple Marduk, they say, contained 18 tons of gold. Eight and a half tons in the altar and the throne alone. It, it had a 20-year food supply. And an interesting note that Saddam Hussein looked to Nebuchadnezzar as his role model. This is from Dr. Klein. He's a Ph.D., a historian and an archaeologist from George Washington University. It says Sodom also portrayed himself as successor to Nebuchadnezzar. In 1979, he was quoted by his semi-official biographer by saying, Nebuchadnezzar stirs in me everything relating to pre-Islamic history. And you can see pictures if you go online to ancient Babylon, which incidentally is not inhabited to this day, and you can see actually bricks that embear or have the name of Nebuchadnezzar written on them, and, and Saddam Hussein tried to rebuild Babylon and re-inhabit it, and you can see that he evidently failed. But if you look in Isaiah chapter 13, verse 20, the Bible gives a prediction and a prophecy that has been fulfilled to this day. It says, Babylon will never be inhabited. And the word of God stands true. Here, Saddam Hussein tried to rebuild Babylon, and he failed in his endeavor. Babylon was represented by the gold, and if we go in our history books, or even in the book of Daniel, the Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 2, verse 32, its chest and arms are of silver. It says, and after you shall arise another kingdom, and we know from history that the Medes and the Persians came and ruled from 539 to 331 B.C., representing by the, by the chest and arms of silver. And if you look in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 5, there was the handwriting on the wall, Belshazzar was slain, and right before the conquest by Cyrus the Mede, it says in Daniel chapter 5 that the handwriting on the wall said, Mine, mine, tekel, eupharsin. Mine, meaning, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. They were known for their silver, which is why silver is a fitting symbol for this next kingdom. Another note of prophecy is that in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1, Cyrus is named by name 150 years before his birth, and the Bible indicates how he would conquer Babylon. Following Babylon was the next kingdom of bronze, the kingdom of Greece under Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great conquered the world at a very early age in his 30s. He died in a drunken stupor, and his kingdom was subdivided by his four generals. Here's a quotation by a historian. He says, I am persuaded that there was no nation, city, nor people where his name did not reach. There seems to me some divine hand presiding both over his birth and his actions. The next kingdom, the kingdom of Rome, it says the fourth kingdom, verse 40, shall be strong as iron inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything like iron that crushes the kingdom will break in pieces and crush all others. And the next kingdom that came on, historians verify that Rome was the kingdom of iron. 
for their weapons of warfare were of iron. Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire tells us the images of gold, of silver, or of brass might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. So for review, the head of gold represents Babylon. The chest and arms of silver represents Medo-Persia. The brass represents Greece. The legs of iron represent the Roman Empire. And here the Bible makes an amazing prediction. It did not say that the next kingdom would be a homogenous kingdom. It would have been logical if Daniel was depending on human revelation because in Babylon's day they believed in cycles, a cyclical history. Another kingdom would have logically come on the scene, but the Bible stops right here and says there's going to be one, two, three, four, and then after that it makes a stunning prediction that stands true even to this day. It says that Western Europe will be divided and never be reunited again. We can read in the news today, if you go online or read your newspaper, that the European Union is having its struggles, for the lack of a better word. The Bible predicts, if we read in our Bibles in verse 41, Whereas, as you saw the feet, the toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it. Just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, and the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seeds of men, but they will not adhere one to another, just as iron does not mix with clay. This prediction holds true even to this day. The kingdom of Rome was divided into ten different tribes, as our next presenter will point out in Daniel chapter 7. The Alamanni became the Germans, the Burgundians became the French, the Franks became the French, the Lombards, the Italians, Saxons became the English, the Suevi, the Portuguese, the Visigoths, the Spanish, and there are three tribes that are extinct the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. The Bible tells us, but they will not cleave one to another, even as iron does not mix with clay. Today, if you go to the Fredericksburg Castle in Denmark, and you go inside of the castle, they have on the walls paintings of how the medieval monarchs tried to unite Europe through marriages. And it seems like an entangled mess as you see that this person's wife was actually the cousin of another person. And you could see the relations between Europe as they tried to in intermingle and reunite Europe through family relations. But the Bible holds true. I can list and go on and on about individuals in human history that tried to reunite Europe. You have Charles V, Hitler, Charlemagne, and Napoleon. And in Napoleon's journal are these words. There will be one Europe. There will be one currency. There will be one language. There will be one government over all of Europe. And Napoleon is quoted after the Battle of Waterloo by saying, God Almighty has been too much for me. God Almighty has been too much for me. Babylon the head of gold, Persia, the chest and arms of silver, Greece, the thighs of bronze, legs of iron, divided Europe partly of iron and partly of clay. Now, I'm not a statistician today, and I'm not into mathematics or probability. But if someone makes a prediction and it comes true, they're one for one, isn't that right? Then they make a second prediction and it comes for true, they're two for two. They make a third one, they're three for three, four, four for four, and then they come to the last one and they make an auda audacious prediction, just as he said about divided Europe. They're five for five. Now they make a sixth prediction that has not yet come true. How much trust 
are you going to have in the last prediction? A lot. Now, the last part of this prophecy is the pinnacle. It's the point of Daniel chapter 2. God is five for five. He's batting 100. 100 percent. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, uh, 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 not another kingdom. It's going to be divided. And furthermore, it will never be reunited. God is right five for five. Why would you bet against him on the next prediction? This to me is the most compelling argument for the second coming and the veracity of Scripture. This to me anchors my reason and my faith in the Word of God. That many skeptics have said that Daniel was re really written after the fact. That's how compelling Daniel chapter 2 actually is. Now, I'm not a betting man, but let's say that I go to the horse races. By the way, I'm not endorsing this type of behavior, but I'm just saying, <laughs> as far as a parable is concerned. Let's say I go to the horse races, and someone appears out of nowhere, and says, David, I think you should bet on horse number five. I say, oh, okay, uh, why not? So I put my money on horse number five, and horse number five wins. Next day, I come to the horse races. I have a little bit more money, and he says, David, today, horse number four. So I say, oh, he's one for one before. I'm going to put it on horse number four. So I put it on horse number four. Horse number three, the next day. Horse number two. Horse number one. Then the next day, he says, I want you to ho bet on horse number 15. You know what I'm probably going to do? I'm probably going to sell my house. <laughs> sell everything that I have, all of my possessions, and place it on horse number 15. Because this guy has been right five for five. Here, God is building his case. I tell you, before it happens, that way when it happens, you will believe. Why would you bet against him on the last part of this prophecy? Let's read the last part of this prophecy in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Amen. Amen. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break pieces and consume all the other kingdoms. And it shall stand for how long? Forever. Forever. Look in verse 45. Inasmuch as you saw the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God has made known unto the king what will come to pass after this. And I love this last sentence. The dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. You can take Daniel 2 to the bank. God was 5 for 5. And you can put your faith in the reality that the second coming is going to be a reality. Amen? Amen? It's time that we invest in the kingdom of heaven. And here, the book of Daniel is telling us that the second coming of Jesus is a surety. That as we look to the future, that we can base it on the reality that God has predicted the future with pinpoint accuracy up until this point, and he was not wrong. I want to read you a statement from Clifford Goldstein. And he writes about Daniel chapter 2, and he says, Look at the odds. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, modern Europe, all came in order just as Daniel predicted. The only last things left 
in the prophecy is the last one. Christ's eternal kingdom. That's what the Lord presents in this chapter are tremendous odds that the promise of His coming and the establishment of His kingdom will be fulfilled. Daniel was right on the first five. Why bet against him on the last? Friends, are you ready for Jesus to come? I believe that we're living at the very final moments of earth's history, and the reality is that the second coming of Jesus, Jesus should dictate how we are living in the present. It should impact our ethics and how we live. Because if we do not believe in evolution, if we don't believe in the prediction of Stephen Hawking that the only solution is that we go out into space, which I believe, ironically enough, I believe is true, we are going out into space, not just in the way that he believes, but we're going on the cloud into heaven, amen? amen? It should dictate our ethics. And when you're standing before God at the second coming of Jesus, and you have the privilege of being alive when he comes, believe you me that your priorities will crystallize. You will suddenly recognize what is really and dearly important to your heart of hearts. You're not going to be wishing, I wish I'd spent more time on Facebook when you're standing before God at the second coming. You're not going to be wishing, I wish I'd spent more time watching television. But heaven forbid, you may just be wishing that you had spent more time with Him in His Word and in prayer. Priority crystallized. God and people, God and souls become preeminently important as we approach the second coming of Jesus. Because when you stand before Him, those are the only two things that will eternally matter. I'd like to close with a dream that a man had. In this dream, he was hearing voices. And it wasn't because he was schizophrenic or had some mental disorder. He was hearing voices and this voice was giving him instructions about what he should do. The voice told him, I want you to walk down this street. And so he listened to the voice and he started walking down this street and he said, I want you to turn down this path. So he turned down this path. And he said, take a right here at the fork and take a left. And finally, he's listening to these instructions. He's feeling almost overwhelmed. And finally, the voice tells him to stop. So he stops. And the voice tells him something very interesting. He says, look, I want you to, to reach down and, and grab these rocks and place them in your pocket. So he, he does this. He says, this is very strange behavior. So he, he reaches down and places these rocks in his pocket. And the voice told him something very interesting. The voice told him, when you go back home, look at those rocks. And when you look at those rocks, you'll be incredibly happy, but you'll be incredibly sad. He thought to himself, how can I be incredibly happy and incredibly sad at the same time? That's simply impossible. So he did what the voice told him. He placed him in his pocket, and he went back home. Obviously, he's curious as to what those rocks were. And he took those rocks out of his pocket, and he looked at them in the light, and they weren't rocks. They were diamonds. Priceless diamonds. And then he understood the voice. He was happy because he was a little bit richer. But he was sad because if he had recognized the value of those rocks, he would have taken more. <laughs> heaven forbid that we're standing on the sea of glass in heaven. And I believe that none of us will recognize the value of a soul until the second coming. I pray that we do, but heaven forbid that we come to the reality of the second coming foretold in Daniel chapter 2 and we say, Lord, 
if I'd only known the value of one soul, I would have done more. I would have invested more in the kingdom of heaven. And it's my prayer for us today that as we look at the surety of the second coming, that we invest our time, our resources, our energies, and talents because Jesus is coming again. Amen? Amen. He's coming to take us home, and He is the final solution for earth's problems. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of our world has come. And the kingdom of our Christ. And He shall reign forever and ever. John chapter 14, verse 29 tells us, And now I've told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. It's my prayer for you here today that you will invest your life in the reality of the second coming. And that when He comes, you will be able to say, This is our God. We have waited for Him. And He will save us. If we don't meet here, Let's meet on the sea of glass. Amen. Amen. May God bless us.